So Drew uh, would be hello. <laughs> would be nice to uh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, the story. Okay. Um, well, my name's Drew, as you said, and I've been teaching guitar for the last eight years. Um, that's my theme. Well, it wasn't always my full-time job, but uh, it's been my full-time job for the last four years. Um, and yeah, I'm 28, live in London, live in South London, and um, run an open mic night as well. Just generally, I suppose you could call me a musician, but I'm a teacher, more of a teacher than a musician, I suppose. Just about, yeah. The okay. Crossover. <laughs> so, so when did you, uh, you know, first start playing the guitar? When did it, when did it hit you that you would want to be a teacher and do this for for a living? Um, well, I'll, to answer your first question, when I started teaching guitar, uh, sorry, started learning guitar, I was about 14. Um, I started quite late. I had friends who were always musical, um, but I didn't really find. I liked to sing, and actually, singing was something I'm. My first instrument is what I've been doing longer than I've been doing uh, guitar playing, actually. Um, but I decided to pick up the guitar so that I could support my voice and learn a few chords. Uh, and I basically started learning guitar. I think really the ultimate reason is to get noticed and to find a girlfriend. I suppose it's probably the absolute reason why I started learning the instrument. But then it kind of went on from there. And I, um, so what was the only question? When did I start teaching? Yeah. Well, why why did you? Yeah. Um, I started teaching purely by accident. I, I was a singer, songwriter, musician, I was writing songs and I did an open mic night where you can just turn up and play and it went really, really well and someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, have you thought about teaching guitar? And that kind of just got my mind thinking about it and I was thinking, yeah, actually, maybe I'll give that a go. So I put an advert on Gumtree, uh, just an online listening site, and I got one response from a dad and I ended up teaching a teenage girl and it was it went okay and I really enjoyed it. Basically the time just flew by and that's when I suddenly walked out of that lesson thinking my god I've just been paid to do that and it felt like the time just completely evaporated and I really really enjoyed it. So yeah. Okay so I guess then the next um, next question is so this was what was it six years ago? Yeah I suppose I started teaching yeah six to seven years ago I suppose really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and 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 I, and I think here, right? For me, I have a few few questions. So, w what has been the profile of of your average student? What is what what kind of? That's a very tough question to answer, but obviously they fall into two categories. There's obviously children where the parents want the child to learn a new skill, which is um, sort of my bread and butter part of the business, the business that is very sort of stable, and uh, and then there is the adult. So the child. Um, it doesn't, they usually start no later than about sort of eight, but I've heard of guitar teachers teaching six-year-olds, five-year-olds, but I've tried that, but it's, it's not for me. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the child. And they could be either male or female. It doesn't really matter. To be honest, it's, you think that it's a boy's thing, but um, I've taught just as many girls as I have boys. Um, and then for adults, generally between 20 to 30, is the average age group to start. Um, if you're a beginner, I mean my oldest beginner is actually 52, uh, so you're never too late to start, and my youngest adult beginner um, is probably 22, I don't know how old you are around, but about that sort of age. Okay. Yeah, um, and an average, I don't know really, an average would be, if they're usually quite creative, they're usually people who like to think outside the box a little bit, um, obviously really enjoy music and enjoy the challenge of taking up something new, um, and yeah, I mean, I, you usually, yeah, I suppose creative is probably a really good word, but I, I appear to attract creative individuals more than I do um, sort of wannabe Music professional musicians. Is a good way of so, so is there is there a thing as musical talent? Oh, that's a very trick. I think that there is a thing as musical passion. I think you can love something so much that you want to play. Because even Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, all these big names that we've heard of, when they first started playing the guitar, they were rubbish. They were their first time. They were absolutely rubbish. They didn't just suddenly pick it up and all of a sudden, all the talent just gushes out and they could do all these amazing solos, etc. They just, but they absolutely loved it. There was something 
inside them that was awakened, some sort of musical, sort of, I suppose you could call that the talent, but I like to call it the passion, the, 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 the will to want to practice and want to move forward and want to get better. And also just feeling like they're at their happiest when they're playing. So I think that's kind of how I'd sum up musical talent. So, so I think then the question is interesting, right? So for a kid uh, who's starting out, what makes the difference? Is it the push of the parent? Is it well, what? What has it been in? Like, what kind of a role do the parents play in a in a kid becoming really good? In a child becoming really good, I've got two children who are quite well, maybe not prodigal. That's a bit of a harsh word, but certainly very very good. Um, and both times, the parent is supportive but not pushing. Yeah, they 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 started when the child was about eight years old and they would encourage the child to practice for the first six months or so so they would say look now's the time to practice let's do it and then eventually the child would just then start practicing without the parent at all and the parent would just be more and more yes they'd be supportive of what they're doing but they certainly wouldn't have to pressurize them into practicing and into playing so i guess the best role a parent could play is um, assisting down the path, but certainly not pushing the path to the student, to a child. Interesting. So, so now let's look at the older group, uh, the group where at least I fall in, right? So, what is your experience with this group? Tell, you know, tell us a little bit about, uh, yeah, well, what kind, uh, what do you find with the motivation levels? Um, yeah, how do they do they become any good? If, if good, you know, so, so how, what is your picture of that? I think when you're an adult it's a little bit harder because obviously you've got less time, you're working, um, you're not like, like a child where you, you get home at three o'clock and you might have a little bit of homework but then you can just more or less do what you like. So I, I think it's different with an adult in terms of finding the amount of time to want to play. But the same rules apply, I think if, if you enjoy it then you're going to want to get home even if you are tired and still play the guitar. You know? um, so in terms of how good they get, well... To be honest, teaching adults is, um, the longest I've ever had an adult stick around with me is two years. Um, so adults very much, once they've learned the core skills, they can then become very independent and they can then start following their own training down a certain path. And also I think it's healthy to be with one teacher for a couple of years and then if you want to start going more advanced and into certain things and maybe look at... Because you'll then decide whether you want to do jazz, whether you want to do rock, whether you want to do improvisation, whether you want to be a teacher or something like that. So therefore, there's then something quite specialist about yeah. it. Um, so I think good for me, it's, it's a very sort of broad uh, bracket, but good for me is having a very core sort of theoretical knowledge of the instrument, but also being able to read a piece of music, but most importantly, being able to enjoy what you're playing and encouraging that passion and that goes back to the motivation that you've said my job really when it comes to adults 25 percent of it is being a motivational coach so i'm choosing material and music that's bespoke to those students that they really love that they that obviously i'm sort of aiming it towards them to something that they can then want to play want to sort of just play as hard as possible, even if I don't like it very much. If they like it, then that's all that matters because I'm then motivating them forward because it's tough, you know, it is really, really tough in the first year, it's very tough. And um, yeah, so you, you just need to push forward. So in, in the guys that make maximum progress, let's say in both levels, mm -hmm. what are some of the most common uh, things you see? Okay, well, I definitely see um, a, a drive, so that, that means that it would just be not necessarily in what they're doing with guitar, but in, in all aspects of their lives. It's something that sort of will drive them. And they've got to actually be quite, it sounds cheesy, but quite goal motivated. So they've got to say, right, at this particular point in time, I'm going to achieve this goal. I have learned these 12 chords. I have learned this so many songs. Um, I know this about the guitar, etc. So I think people who think like that, it, it does make more of a difference in terms of their progress. Um, but the other thing with the progress, it goes back to the same thing about talent versus passion. It really is it's just that they absolutely enjoy it. There might be certain elements that they're not very good at, but then there'll be other elements that they will absolutely excel at, like being able to write a song or being able to play I don't know, one of their favourite pieces exceedingly well, you know, and something that's very technically difficult they might want to master it. So, sorry, I've gone off track. What was the question? <laughs> what, what do you, what yeah. traits do you what see? Trade, what traits do you see? Yeah. Um, 
Organisational skills is a big one, you know, obviously being able to commit to say I've got these 20 minutes, so time management, yeah. you know, essentially saying right, this 20 minutes I'm going to stick to uh, my practice regime. Um, determination, um, passion, which I said a lot about, um, yeah definitely determination is a big one. And visualisation is a big one, so being able to see yourself performing that song or see yourself playing what you want to play. Um, I think that's the same with anything in life really, though, that one. if you sort of visualise yourself doing it. And little steps as well, it's not going to happen overnight. I think people who respect the fact that it's a skill, so it takes steps. People who want to just jump straight in and do all the advanced stuff, they're the ones that are going to give up because they realise that it's, they're not going to learn it in two months. So, um, Okay, so so now now again I'm gonna switch back to the kids again. It's two very different. So uh, oh, yeah. So how do you go about preparing uh, in this case for a kid lesson versus an adult lesson? What is what what sort of because you obviously play different roles cool. as a teacher, right? Because the adults are less uh, respecting. Let's put it that way. All the kids are probably a lot more deferential. You'd uh, be surprised, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah, you will be surprised. It depends. I've taught certainly some really children. There's no doubt about that. But. Um, I think the difference is, is that for an adult, they know what they want to learn. Yeah, so they've, they've obviously developed an identity. So it's easier to plan towards a, an adult lesson because they say, right, I want to learn, I don't know, Brian Adams or something like that. Yeah? So they know that that's what they want to achieve. Whereas with a child, it's, and it, it, I'll come back to the adult in a minute, but with, with a child, it's more, you need to sort of just start, it, it's easier for them to, take up the theoretical principles like teaching the musical alphabet and maybe not easier but it's more important for them when they're younger I think because then they can take it with them whereas with an adult it's more important to get the results of being able to play a few chords and be able to um, uh, yeah being able to play a song um, but yeah and also with the child I, th I think the role that I play is it needs to be fun but you know, so it needs to be quite engaging and fun for what they're doing, and I have to be quite lively, have to have a lot of energy, more so than I necessarily need with that, although being a one-to-one -one teacher, you do actually need, and a class teacher, you need a lot of energy, and you need to be quite physically expressive and um, to, to get your message across. Um, what's with kids? Children do grades, so that's a graded music system, so therefore they're getting qualifications. Adults, I don't, I have, I've never taught a single adult that wants to do a grade. Yeah. So I'm sure that will happen in, in my life. Um, so yeah, that's that's different. It's more, it's slightly more academic, I yeah. suppose you could say. Okay. Whereas it's more artistic, expressive with an adult. Okay. Um, although you've got to try and get a bit of academia in there. Yeah. You know, somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, because they're going to get to the point where. They'll be able to play everything, but they won't know what any of that stuff means. You know, yeah, they won't yeah. know any of the core principles, why it sounds the way it does, etc. Um, so yeah, that's. But yeah, I suppose that's the that's, that's the biggest difference in role. You you're you're more academic with a child, and with an adult, you're more free. You you, yeah. you, you, you no, it's hard to explain. More free is probably the wrong way of putting it, but there's there's more. Um, They've got identity. They know what they want. Yeah. It's easier to do. Yeah. So, so what have been in your is it six, seven years now as a guitar teacher? So you're getting to the so if we take ten years as the time it takes to become an expert, you're soon becoming or if not become. Yeah. What have been the biggest learnings in in the journey along the way? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think you have to learn to when you do the trial lesson when you meet the student for the first time you have to more make a character assessment. Nothing to do with their skill level or their passion. You, you have to think, right, well, I'm going to be seeing this person every week. Are we going to get on? Are we going to enjoy each other's company? Because if the pupil doesn't respect the teacher and doesn't, you know, they're not that friendly, then it's going to be harder for them to learn anything. So I think that was one rule that I learned very early on. But luckily I'm pretty good with people, so it, you know, obviously that helps being able to make that sort of assessment. Um, so that's, that was one of the rules that I learned very, very early on. In terms of an academic sense, I've got no qualifications to teach. Well, in fact, I'm, next week I'm sitting my grade 8 guitar exam, so I will have qualifications this time next week, which is exciting. Um, so I had to learn everything 
upwards. So what really helped was learning with the students. So I would, essentially, you need to always be one step ahead of your student. It doesn't matter if you're loads of steps ahead, you've got to be one step ahead, and then you've got to be able to communicate that step yeah. to the pupil. Yeah. So if you're one step ahead, then that, that's a good thing. I don't necessarily, in my opinion, I've been taught by teachers who've got no qualifications, but they're fantastic musicians. Um, so as long as they can communicate why, how they're good musicians, communicate those skills across, they should be teachers, in my opinion. I don't feel that just because you've got a piece of paper, you've come straight out of college, that you're going to be any good at teaching at all. I think you need to put in the time, you need to have taught a minimum of 100 students before you're anywhere near a level where your students are going to start excelling quickly. You know? And obviously that gives you time to build up your syllabus, so that goes to sil so syllabus is another thing. When I started teaching, it would take me, to teach an hour lesson, it would take me two hours to plan it, because I'd had no materials. Whereas over the last seven or eight years, I've built up so many materials now that I can just sort of pull them out and go and say, right, let's go and play this. Um, but having said that, I bespoke lessons, so adults especially say, I want to learn this song, especially someone like yourself around. They say, I want to learn this song, so I have to go out and learn it, yeah. um, regardless of if I like it. But I just <laughs> have to go out and learn it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've learned that it's about communication. It's the biggest thing, really. If you can communicate and you're one step ahead, then you can be a very good teacher, in my opinion. Um, and if you learn that students learn in different ways, some like to see something, some like to hear it, some like to be able to read it, um, there's, there's those, those elements. And you've got to also treat every person bespoke, because we're all different. So, whereas one person would... Um, really like this death metal song uh, <laughs> I'm teaching, another person's absolutely going to hate that, you know, so you can't turn up with your materials and think that one size fits all and that's also something that I did wrong in the beginning I, I used to just turn up and say, well I like this so let's learn this um, but that doesn't work that way, because 90% of the students' progress is made outside of the lessons they only make 10% inside the lessons um, so, yeah. so, so what do you do if a, if a student repeatedly does not practice? I mean, I, I can imagine, it's a tough one, right? Because you, you control, of course, setting the path, but at the end of the day, that, that's all you can control, right? So, so what happens if, if people don't practice? I mean, just out of curiosity, but... Sure, well, obviously lessons become very boring because you're turning up each week and you're teaching the same lesson because they haven't practiced. Yeah. So it becomes boring for the teacher, it becomes boring for the student as well. And the student usually gets a bit disheartened um, if they're not practicing. Now, when someone isn't practicing, the first thing I say is, right, um, well, how's your week been? I mean, that's generally what you say, isn't it, when you meet someone anyway, when you see them weekly. So yeah. you say, how's their week been? And normally at that point, a student will say, oh, you know, it's been... I've never had a student say, I've done loads of practice. That never happens, because students always have very high expectations of themselves, I've found. And they'll say oh, you, yeah, I did some practice, and I and I'll say, well, that doesn't really seem like very much. And they say, well, I didn't do as much as I liked. That's the line I hear so much from students. I didn't do as much as I liked. And I said, well, how much did you do? And they say, well, I practiced every day for about an hour. And I said, that's too much. What are you doing that much for? You know, and I think they, they think that they need to put in, like, so much time the whole time. But as you know, it's, you know, little and often, little and often with something physical. Um, so when they're not practicing, if... If the week has actually been okay and they've had time to practice and they still haven't practiced, then at that point I will then say, right, well, what the materials are you? In, is this a path you'd like to try? You know, and then I'll get them to play it and just see that if they were practicing, they could have been practicing it wrong. So when they come to it and I say, right, you've been practicing it wrong, it's actually like this, and they'll be like, oh, okay. And then that way they can then go and practice that week. So maybe something was not quite told correctly the week before. That, that, that does happen every now and then. Um, and then the other one really is, uh, if it starts happening repeatedly, that's when you know if it's in the first three months that they're not gonna be guitarists. Um, you never know, do you, until you try. So I always say this to students at the beginning, I say, generally, 80% of the people I teach within, uh, 80% of them generally don't go on to be guitarists, but there's always like, two out of ten that will. Um, it's just the way it is. But if you've been playing for a good five or six months and you're enjoying it and you're practicing and it's not just the lessons that are motivating you, you're motivating yourself, 
then you will become a guitarist for the rest of your life. And ultimately, that's my job. I'm, I'm here to, I want to turn these people who are curious about an instrument into people who want to learn forever. And that's a pretty cool job to have. Cool. A couple of questions remaining. One is, one is what have been, who have been uh, some mentors or, and this could be beyond people you know, it could be a Slash for all I care, right? But it's, it's about, it's who are these people and, and what have you learned from you them? Mean in teaching or, mean, or Just as a musician, as, as, as a person, what has, in te as a teacher, you know, a couple of people that come straight up to mind and, and what you've learned from them. Okay. Well, first one's really, really easy. It's my uh, closest and best friend, Dave who's in a band called Isserus, who do progressive rock, it's isserus.com for them. Um, and they, he, he was my closest friend and he's always been a lot better at guitar than me, and he still is a lot better at guitar than me. And I would just watch him play for a very long time. I've been in bands with him for about eight years as well, uh, in and out of bands together. And I would just watch him play and I would always, and I still do, say to him, oh, I'm trying to learn this technique. And, He's not, he's a rubbish teacher, he's got no patience at all, but I'll just watch him play and I can take away that influence. And also things that we've talked about, we've got similar musical influences yeah. and we've written music together, so there's a strong bond there. So we, we are, um, yeah, we are, I, I've taken influence from him, as I'm sure he's taken influence from me. Second person would be a little bit harder, um, but it would probably be... Uh, a group and it would probably be Radiohead that are my favourite band. Okay. Um, there's just something about their music that gives me the tingles, that motivates me, that kind of makes me feel really, really good, you know, about everything. Even though when people say, oh, Radiohead, it's really depressing. I actually like that sound. It makes me feel very, very happy. That's the weird thing. And it's very uplifting music and they're extremely... They prove to me what five individuals can sound like in a band when they're all on exactly the same page, which is very hard to do in a band. Okay, good. Um, I think two other. Uh, the, one is one is a, one is a question. The other is actually a request for you to play whatever sure. one thing you like. But uh, one one this this one is you know there are a lot of people out there who are learning things, mm -hmm. and this is beyond guitar, you know. But in many ways, the journeys are not too different. You know, at the end of the day, when you learn, it, it's pretty much. Mm -hmm. The same yeah, things, right? It's like yeah. determination, persistence. So what is a message that you have to all these people who are out there learning stuff? Okay. I think you should never stop learning. I think that's really, really important. So I think that you, if you become complacent, then you're no longer... Uh, even if you're, you're considered a master, a master is essentially still a student because they're always still learning. So I think that's that's very important to never stop, even when you think you've absorbed everything there is to know. I think there is always other avenues. And I think to write down your goals is extremely important in everything, in whatever you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think to, if they're written down, you can see them, then you're going to wake up every day, if they're in your bedroom or something, you're going to wake up every day, you're going to look at them and you're going to think, right, okay. And you will do them, you will tick them off. I didn't believe this until I tried it. Yeah. And then when I tried it, I thought, okay. And obviously some of the goals shift as life goes on. Certain things are different. So that's why you have like short term, medium term and long term. So six months to a year, one, one year to three years, three, five years plus, you know. Um, and I didn't realise that. And I looked at this sheet. I don't keep it on my wall, actually. I just keep it in a folder. And I looked at it and I thought, yeah, I've done that. I've done that. But even if you don't look at it, it mentally tells you, it mentally pushes you forward. It's really weird seeing it written down. I, I can't explain how that works, but it does work. Um, so I think if you're learning something and you want to be very, very good at it, I think write down the little steps that you want to take. Because little steps is, is the best way of achieving something colossal. You know, it's achieving something really big for yourself, regardless of what it is. You know. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, okay, go. Cool.
no expression Hide my head, I want to drown my sorrows No tomorrow, no tomorrow